Today is our third week of doing what is really an in-depth dive into what Jesus himself identifies as the most important command in the entire Bible, which comes from the book of Deuteronomy, which was written over a thousand years before Jesus' time and everything. Um, but the command is this, hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. You shall love Yahweh your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Jesus identifies this as the most important command, and so what we're doing is we are spending some time diving into it. And what we're doing is we are just going slowly but surely, and we are taking this one word at a time. And this is our second week focusing on the very first word, and I don't worry, we're not going to spend that much time on every single word or else this would be a very long series. Um, but the reason I want to spend so much time on this very first word, which is the word Shema, which means to hear, is because I don't really think you can grasp the rest of the command and even begin to apply it if you don't understand this very first word, right? Because the whole point of the word to hear is it's calling you to listen. And if you want to obey the command, you probably need to understand what the command is saying, right? And so last week, if you remember, we started tracing that Hebrew word Shema starting way back in the Garden of Eden, and we started seeing how it showed up all throughout the story of Israel's history, right? So we saw the Garden of Eden, and then eventually we moved into the book of Exodus where we saw the people of Israel enslaved and God heard their cries and came to deliver them. And then we eventually saw them through the book of the Judges uh, whenever there was no king in Israel, and eventually, whenever there actually was a king in Israel, we got to see how people like King Solomon, right? This amazingly wise king, how he prayed that God would give him a heart that hears. And the main thing we talked about last week was the fact that whenever God calls the people to hear, it's doing more than just asking you to like have it go in your ear, right? The call to hear demands action, right? So it's not simply about the information processing in your head. It's what you do with that information, that's what we talked about last week. And what I want to do today is I want to begin with a question. What's at stake if we decide not to hear? Right? Because I mean, really, a lot of times whenever we talk about the most important commandment, we focus on the second command. You know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. But there's really two commandments there, right? And it starts with hearing. And I want to ask, what is at stake if we choose to disobey that first commandment? And you'll notice that last week I ended us at this time period in Israel's history, which is known as the United Monarchy, right? This is a time period whenever all of the kingdom of Israel was united under one king. Uh, and it was by and large, a really good time for the people. And the reason I stopped us there is because the answer to the question I just asked you begins as soon as that kingdom shatters. So if you know anything about the history of the people of Israel, um, king Solomon was the final king of the united monarchy, right? He was a really good king at first, governing in wisdom. He built a temple for God. Everything was going great. But towards the end of his life, he started looking more like a worldly king than a holy king. And Solomon started multiplying wealth. He started multiplying wives. He started multiplying all the things that the law forbade kings of Israel to multiply. And so as punishment for this, God said that he was going to split the kingdom. And 10 tribes, there's 12 tribes in Israel, 10 of the tribes go north and they follow another king. And then two of the tribes stay with Solomon's family line uh, and the family line of King David, right? And so the northern, tri uh, the northern kingdom is called Israel. The southern kingdom is called Judah. You don't really need to remember all of that stuff right now. The main thing you need to know is that this time period is not a stable time period for the people of Israel, right? Things are going really, really badly. And what we're gonna see is that the people are not hearing God, right? But it just so happens that at this time period, God is sending more people than ever that the people should be hearing. Because during this time period of instability, what God starts doing is he starts sending to them prophets, right? And these prophets, basically their primary function is to get onto the people and try to call the people to repentance so that the people will turn back to God. But the thing is the people, they refuse to listen. They refuse to hear, to Shema. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to start today by actually looking at some places where the word Shema shows up during this time period. Because I think if we start by looking here and then if we actually go into the New Testament, we'll get to see what's at stake if we, like the people of Israel, choose 
not to hear. And once again, I will remind you, we are not the people of Israel. And so there is a distinction there, but like the people of Israel, we have been set apart by God. And the God that we as Christians worship is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so if Israel was called to love that God, then we as Christians are also called to love that same God because he is the God of all creation. And so while there is a distinction between us and Israel, we're still called to love God with all of our hearts. And so we need to learn from their mistakes. And so what I wanna do, I wanna start in Isaiah chapter six. Isaiah chapter six is where we actually get to hear about this amazing prophet named Isaiah, and we get to actually see how he was called to ministry. And the way that Isaiah chapter six starts off is really crazy because it actually opens up with Isaiah getting a vision of the throne room of God. Uh, this is probably something that all of us wish we could see, but Isaiah himself is terrified by this moment. He says, all of a sudden he was caught up in the spirit and there he was in the throne room of God. God is sitting on the throne. All these angelic divine beings are flying all around and the glory of the Lord is just shaking the whole room. And Isaiah is absolutely terrified. And in the midst of all this, God is going to speak and the word Shema is going to show up four times in these next few verses. Isaiah chapter six, starting in verse eight. And I heard the voice of Yahweh saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and the ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Now, if you were following with me there, you might've only heard the word hear three times. But that's because there's this one thing that um, the Hebrew language does, and we kind of do this sometimes in English as well. Uh, but there's this one thing that the Hebrew language does that whenever they're emphasizing something, they'll repeat the word two times, right? And Jesus does this. Like you're probably familiar with it if you're ever reading the teachings of Jesus. If he's trying to get people's attention, he'll say, truly, truly, I say to you, right? In Greek, it's amen, amen, right? He's trying to get their attention. Well, that's how the Hebrew language works. If they're trying to emphasize something, they'll repeat the word twice. And that's what you see uh, whenever it says, keep on hearing, but do not understand. In Hebrew, it's literally shema, shema. Hear, hear, but do not understand. So what we see in this passage is this. Um, Isaiah is in the throne room of God. God speaks and he says, who shall I send? And he doesn't specify what the mission is. He just says, who shall I send? And Isaiah jumps at the opportunity, right? He hears God and what does he do? He responds. Well, that's really good for Isaiah because that means Isaiah is doing what we learned we should do last week, right? He hears and he acts, okay? Well, Isaiah says, here I am, send me. He doesn't even ask what he's supposed to be doing. He just says, God wants somebody to do something, I'm in. And then after he does that, God responds and tells him exactly what his job is going to be. And he says, go and say to this people, right? This is the people of Judah during the time period of the divided monarchy, right? This is the people of Judah who are living in rebellion against God. And God says, tell this to the people. Hear, hear, shema, shema, but do not understand. See, see, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So the task that Isaiah is given is one that actually sounds kind of perplexing to us because he is actually sent to the people to confuse them. This is what's at stake if we do not hear and respond to God what's gonna happen is that our hearts will be hardened, right? We are going to harden our own hearts. And if we're not careful, God will also begin to harden our hearts against him, right? Our hearts become calloused, right? So these people, they're going to hear Isaiah's words, hear, hear, but they're not gonna understand. They're going to see, see the things Isaiah does, but they're not gonna perceive it. His words are going to go in one ear and out the other. And it's because what they've done is they have resisted God's word again and again and again. These are people who grew up hearing the Shema recited. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. You shall love Yahweh with all of your heart and soul and strength. But they chose not to hear. And so Isaiah is being sent to them to judge them. 
right? And he's being sent to them to actually demonstrate the hardness of their hearts so that even though they do hear, they're not going to act. And even though they see him, they're not going to see. And this is something that we see throughout the prophets. If you go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 12, you see a very similar thing. The word of Yahweh came to me. Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see, but see not, who have ears to hear, but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. So he says, the issue isn't that the people don't have ears. The issue isn't that the people are physically deaf. The issue is that they have physical ears, but they're spiritually deaf. And that's because they have constantly and consistently refused to hear me. And this is something that we just see. Whenever we allow sin to creep into our lives, and whenever we don't fight back against sin, and whenever we refuse to submit to God, what happens is that we become calloused. We become hardened. So whenever God is even shouting from the mountaintops, we can't hear it and we can't understand it. That's what's at stake with this. And sure enough, whenever you jump to the New Testament, that's the only parts I'm gonna quote from the prophets, but it's all throughout it if you keep looking. But if you jump to the New Testament, Jesus says the same exact thing. Now, the New Testament was written in Greek, not in Hebrew. So you don't find the word Shema in the New Testament, but you do find its equivalent. In Greek, the word is akuo right? And it means the same thing. It means to hear. And whenever you actually go into the gospels, Jesus has a phrase that he repeats that sounds a whole lot like the prophets. Uh, Whenever I was just looking it up, I found seven different occurrences and we're not going to go through each of them because he's repeating the same thing. But I found seven different occurrences where Jesus says this one particular phrase. Uh, One example is in Matthew chapter 11, verse 15. He says this, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus is speaking like a prophet. He's speaking to the people of Israel, but Jesus, like the prophets, knows that he's going to be rejected by the people, right? Jesus, like the prophets, knows that he is speaking to a people who are living in rebellion against God. And so he, just does, he doesn't just assume that people are going to hear. He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And if you actually read the story of Jesus, you'll notice that at the beginning of his ministry, he's a lot more forthright and straightforward with his teachings. Right Early on in Jesus' ministry, he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount and he's very clearly articulating his teachings. But then as opposition begins to build against Jesus, do you know what he starts doing? He starts teaching in parables. And whenever the disciples ask Jesus why he teaches in parables, do you know what he quotes? Isaiah chapter six. And he says, so that the people will hear but not understand. So the people will see but not perceive. He says, the reason why I'm teaching in parables is because the people have rejected me. And so the reason why Jesus starts teaching these almost hidden teachings is in light of the people's rejection. So that's what's at stake whenever we don't hear. And it doesn't end with Jesus, right? Jesus repeats it again and again. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He repeats that multiple times in the gospels. But whenever you get to the book of Revelation, in the early chapters of Revelation, we read these seven letters that Jesus writes to the seven churches, right? So we're not just dealing with Israelites anymore. We are dealing with churches, right? People who have believed in Jesus. And seven times in those letters as well, Jesus says the same exact phrase. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches, right? So we face that same thing. We are challenged to hear and to respond. It's not enough to simply read through the passage and it's not enough to simply recite the memory verse. We are called to hear what Jesus says and to respond. And if you actually read those letters that Jesus is writing to these churches in Revelation, there are clear responses that they're supposed to do, right? They're called to endure. They're called to go through suffering. And Jesus says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Uh, John himself, the apostle, he says the same thing later on in Revelation. Revelation 13, nine, if anyone has an an ear, let him hear, right? And so one thing I'm just trying to highlight here is that there really is a lot at stake if we just ignore this first command. Because if you don't actually hear what Moses is commanding the people of Israel to do, you're not going to be able to actually follow the second command, right? If you don't hear what he means when he says Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone, you're not going to actually be able to love Yahweh with all of your heart and soul and strength. You have to hear him and you have to understand what he's saying in order to actually begin to apply it, right? So I would say there's a lot at stake here. But Jesus actually has to say more about hearing. Um, And if you go to the Gospel of John, 
right? So I mentioned how Jesus says that one phrase, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. He says that a bunch of times, but that's only found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what we call the synoptic gospels. And then he says it again in the book of Revelation, which was written by the same guy who wrote the gospel of John. But interestingly, he never actually says that phrase in the gospel of John itself. I just found that interesting. That doesn't mean that the gospel of John is silent though in regards to Jesus's opinion on hearing. There's this one story that sticks out to me whenever I think about this. And the word hearing never actually shows up in the text, but you'll understand what I'm getting at once I read it. Um, this story takes place after Jesus is resurrected, right? So Jesus, he comes to earth, he lives this faithful life, he dies for our sins. And after he resurrects, he begins to appear to his disciples. But if you remember the story, there's one disciple who does not believe. And this guy's name is Thomas, right? He usually goes down in history known as Doubting Thomas. And if I'm being entirely honest, I feel like Thomas gets a little bit of a bad rap um, because if you're reading the text closely, you'll notice that none of the apostles really believed until they saw Jesus. It just so happens that at the time when Jesus appeared to the other apostles, Thomas wasn't there, right? And so technically all of them doubted. Thomas just wasn't there at the time whenever he appeared to everybody else. Should Thomas have believed their testimony? Yes but I'm just pointing out that really all of them are guilty of doubting at some point. But eventually what happens is Jesus does appear to Thomas and he is going to confirm that he has indeed come back to life. And this is what we read in the gospel of John chapter 20, starting in verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him and said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So like I mentioned, I think Thomas gets a little bit of a bad rap because yes, he did doubt but he's also the very first person in the gospels to explicitly call Jesus God. He says, my Lord and my God, right? This is like, this is like the climax of the gospel of John. And usually what we focus on is the fact that he didn't believe. But his response here is really cool. But Jesus' response is equally cool. And like I said, the word hearing doesn't show up here, but if you notice what he says, he says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not yet not seen and yet have believed. Well, if you believe without seeing, do you know how you're believing? You're believing from hearing, right? That's the whole point. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm really glad that you've believed me from what you've seen, but blessed are those who have believed without seeing, which is really cool because has anybody in here ever like seen Jesus face to face? Has anybody in here ever had the opportunity to do what Thomas got to do right here and put your fingers in the holes where he was crucified? No. So whenever Jesus says, blessed are those who have believed without seeing, well, he's talking about us. Because if we have believed, it's not because we've seen, it's because we've heard. Which kind of ties back to what I think Jesus is communicating here. From Jesus' perspective, hearing is more important than seeing. And I think this is especially relevant in our current culture uh, because we currently live in a culture where people say like, if I can't see it, I won't believe it. But here's the issue with that. Whenever you believe based on your own sight, what you're doing is you're being self-reliant, right? You are saying, I, like, I am the only judge of what is good and bad, of what is true and false. I will only believe it if I have seen it with my own two eyes. You are insisting that you are the only one who can decide what is true, right? And you are relying entirely on yourself. Whenever you believe by hearing though, you're having to place your faith in another, right? None of us in this room believe in Jesus because we have personally seen him face to face and have put our fingers in the holes on his wrists or on his feet. The reason why we believe is because we believe that the accounts recorded in scripture are trustworthy. And we believe that we have good evidence to believe in these things, right? It's not a blind faith where we just like take a shot in the dark and just choose a religion. It's a faith that we can be very confident in, but it still is faith. Right? We're not relying on our own ability to, per to perceive truth. We're trusting that God has revealed himself through the apostles and through the prophets in his word. 
And we're choosing to place our trust in that word. And I think that kind of ties in to what Moses was saying to the Israelites back in Deuteronomy. Because I think I mentioned this last week, but the word Deuteronomy, uh, it breaks down into really two parts. The word Deutero means second, and the word Nanos means law, right? It's the second law. And the reason why you have the whole book of Deuteronomy is because if you remember, once the people of Israel got out of Egypt, well, that first generation was pretty rebellious. And so God sentenced them to wander in the wilderness, and eventually they died in the wilderness. And so whenever Moses is delivering Deuteronomy, he's delivering it to a whole new generation, right? And this is a different generation than the generation that left Egypt. I think it makes sense that Moses tells them to hear, not to see. Because if you think about it, the previous generation, they got to see all the amazing things God did, right? They got to be there in Egypt when all these plagues were falling down upon the land. They got to walk through parted waters and they got to see the waters sticking up on both sides as God delivered them from their enemy. They got to see God's presence descend on Mount Sinai and they got to see the smoke and the lightning and the thunder and they got to see all these amazing, miraculous things God did. That was the first generation. The second generation though, they were kids when that happened, right? Those are fading memories in their mind. Now they're grown up. Now they are going into a land and they're not expecting to see all the same things to the same degree as what that previous generation saw. And so Moses doesn't say, see, O Israel. He says, hear, O Israel. Hear the testimony that was passed down to you. How your parents told you why they were wandering in this wilderness. Hear that testimony and believe it and remember it. And then it makes sense why whenever you keep reading the passage, if you remember on the first week, we read the verses after that. He says, and bind this on your arm and bind this on your head and recite it whenever you go out, whenever you come in and teach it to the future generations. The idea is that you're passing down the faithful testimony and you're teaching people the art of faith, right? You're teaching people to not be self-reliant, but to trust in the faithful witness that was handed down from the people before you, right? And so I think it makes sense that Moses would tell them to hear. And Jesus actually says more about this whenever it comes to the whole hearing versus seeing thing. Um, during his ministry, uh, we actually have several people who come before Jesus and they say, we want a sign from you. Right? They're saying, hey, we've heard all your teachings and we've heard that you've performed all these miracles, but we want to see it face to face. And this happens on several occasions. I'll just quote one of them. But in Matthew chapter 12, uh, we see this exact type of thing happen. And we read this starting in verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And to really just take that whole teaching and condense it down, whenever Jesus says the sign of the prophet Jonah, what he's talking about is his resurrection, right? If you remember the story of Jonah back in the Old Testament, um, he was in the belly of a fish for three days and then he was spit up. Well, Jesus says, just as Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so Jesus, the son of man, will be three days in the heart of the earth and then he will rise. And so Jesus says, why do you keep wanting signs? Haven't I done enough? Haven't you heard enough? Haven't the reports about me confirmed who I am? He says, a wicked and adulter adulterous generation seeks a sign because the thing is, they're wanting to rely on themselves. And he says, you've heard enough. He says, you want a sign? I'll give you one sign. Kill me and wait three days. Whenever I'm walking around alive, there's your sign. But usually by then it's too late because they've already picked their sides. The people who are going to believe in that sign are the people who had already heard and believed. So he says, you want a sign? There you go. The cool thing is that there are exceptions to that. There are some people who did not believe in Jesus until after the resurrection. And so for those people, they're kind of like Thomas. They believe because they saw, but blessed are those who have believed without seeing. And the apostle Paul agrees with this whole thing, right? If you ask the apostle Paul, he says that faith comes from hearing, right? If you go to the book of Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. Notice that Paul does not say faith comes from seeing. 
Faith comes from hearing. We have good evidence to believe what we've heard, but ultimately your faith comes from hearing. If you see it, it's no longer faith, right? If you see it, it's just straight up knowledge, right? That's why if you go to 1 Corinthians, I don't have this in my notes or anything, but if you go to 1 Corinthians, you know, uh, Paul says, now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Well, that's because ultimately whenever you get to heaven and whenever you get into the presence of God, faith and hope don't really exist anymore because faith is whenever you're trusting in something that you don't yet see and hope is the thing that you don't yet see. And so whenever you're in the presence of God, well, you're not putting your faith in it because you see him, right? You know he's there and you are, your hope has been realized. So love is the greatest of these things because love exists eternally, right? Right? But it's the same thing. Faith comes from hearing. We have to choose to believe in what has been passed down to us. Hearing is really the thing that we're all called to. Uh, we just finished studying the book of 2 Timothy at the end of last year. And Paul talks about hearing in that book as well. 2 Timothy chapter 1. He says this to Timothy. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So as Paul was getting to depart from this life, he tells Timothy, remember what you heard right? The things that you hear, that's what you've got to build your life upon. It's the teachings that you've heard in God's word. He says the same thing in chapter two, whenever he's giving Timothy principles of discipleship. He says, you then my child be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also, right? For Paul, for Jesus, for Moses, for all these people, it always comes back to what you heard right? You heard and you believed. And how beautiful are the feet of the people who carry that good news, right? That's the importance of discipleship because somebody at some point shared the gospel with you and you heard it and you believed. And now you have the opportunity to share it so somebody else can hear and somebody else can believe, right? The hearing leads to action, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of others, right? That's the whole point. The entire Christian faith is built on Hearing and response, hearing and response. Whenever you look in the Old Testament, you've got all these other religions who had all these other idols and their faith was built on sight, right? They worshiped gods that they could see, right? But those weren't the one true God, right? The one true God, he demanded a relationship that was built off faith, right? You hear and you believe. You hear and you believe. You hear and you choose to respond based off what you hear. And I was going to quote some stuff from Revelation and stuff because if you actually go read Revelation, hearing is a big thing in there as well. Um, but really what I want to do is I just want to begin to wrap this up by just talking about what we do with this information. Because I know you're sitting here and you're like, man, we have spent two weeks talking about one word. Why is it so important? Well, it goes back to what I said about our entire Christian faith is built on hearing, right? Like I said, none of us have seen Jesus. One day we will in this weird time place where we're in, where we're after the apostles who got to see him and we're before the future resurrection where we will see him, what we do is we live by faith. And so we are kind of like the people of Israel who just got out of the wilderness, right? And we have to live based off what we hear. And so what do we do with this information? First off, we recognize that it is the hearing, not the seeing that mattered. In the same way that the people of Israel going into the promised land had to trust on what they heard rather than what they saw, we have to realize we have to do the same thing, right? Um, a lot of people, like, I mean, I can't tell you how many conversations that I've had with people where they say, you know, I would believe in Jesus if only I could, if I could see something, right? If he wrote his name in the clouds. Well, Jesus has a response to that. He says, you've been given Moses and law and the prophets. If you don't believe them, you're not gonna believe in a sign, right? People will use seeing as an excuse for not believing, but we have to realize we can't do that, right? We want to see, but what that should do is not make us not believe. That should make us eager to see, right? Right now, we believe by hearing, but one day we will get to see him. That should make us excited, right? It shouldn't make us not believe. It should make us all the more eager to believe because one day we will see the thing which we had heard about, right? I love reading the gospels and then reading Revelation because if you look at the two portraits of Jesus, they're so different, right? But they're both the same Jesus, right? In the gospels, you have this like meek and mild Jesus who shows up to give grace and love to sinners. But in the book of Revelation, he comes as a conquering king, ready to 
bring about his righteous and perfect kingdom. And I love that because I hear it and all it does is make me all the more eager to one day see that Jesus face to face. And that's what we need to do, right? And so we need to make sure that we're not being like the rest of the world who says, I will only believe if I see it. Don't rely on yourself. We have good reason to trust what the Bible says. And Pastor Rob's covering a lot of those reasons every Sunday when we're going through our apologetic series, right? So we have good reasons to believe it. And the cool thing is, is you can test those reasons, but we can believe it, right? So that's the first thing, right? Rely on hearing, not on seeing. And then the second thing that we need to do with this is the same thing I talked about last week. We have to realize that hearing demands action, right? Whenever we go into the Shema, and we hear those first words, hear, O Israel. This is not simply Moses telling everybody, hey guys, I want you to listen up. He's saying, I want you to listen up because the things I'm about to say will change your life forever if you understand them. And so as we go into the rest of this series, we're going to move on past this one word, and I know y'all are all excited about that, uh, to finally move on past Shema. But you're not going to actually be able to apply the rest of it if you have not chosen in your heart to actually hear what it is saying and to do something in response. Whenever we look at the phrase, Yahweh is our God, you have to figure out what to do with that information. Whenever it says Yahweh alone is our God, you have to figure out what to do with that information. Whenever it says you shall love him with all of your heart, it's not enough to be like, yeah, I know I should. No, you have to figure out what will I do with that command? How can I actually begin to go do it? Am I simply going to let it go in one ear and out the other? Am I simply going to recite it as the most important commandment? Or am I actually going to try to do it? Am I going to actually try to figure out what it means to love him with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my strength? That's why I wanted to spend so much time talking about this one word, because you've got to realize that this is a demand on us, right? He is saying, it's your decision to hear. Right? You can choose to hear now and obey, or you can choose to not hear, in which case you will have ears but will not hear. You will have eyes but you will not see. We don't wanna be that. We want to be people who hear and respond. And so that's why we spent so much time talking about one word. Um, two weeks from now, we will go into the rest of it. And the reason why we're not doing it next week is because next week we have a potluck. And so, yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to pray for us real quick, and then y'all will be able to head out. Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us here today. Um, I pray that as we continue to just break down um, these few verses, God, that we won't get bored by it, and um, we won't find it too repetitive, but we'll recognize that sometimes in order to truly apply these commands, we need to reflect on them, God, because so often we hear verses repeated again and again and again, and the words kind of just become numb to our ears. And just like you warned in the scriptures, we hear, but we, we have ears to hear, but we do not hear. And so I pray, God, that as we continue going through this passage, that won't happen to us. But instead, every time we hear these words recited, they will, it'll be like us hearing it for the very first time. That's what we need, God, so that we can actually go out and apply it, not for our sake, but for your sake and for your glory. We love you, God, and we praise you. We thank you for all the things that you've done. We thank you for the rich history that you have given us in scripture that we can learn from and that we can apply in our lives. And I pray that as we depart from here today, we will all be safe and that we will not leave you here, God, but we'll take you with us and we will live for you in the days and weeks and months and years to come. It's in your name we pray, amen.